Okay, so welcome. So today we're doing file genetics. Um, so my research program is basically centered on file genetics. I'm choosing to devote my waking hours to this stuff, right? So I think it's important for a reason. So I'll tell you why and how it helps us understand macroevolution. Okay, but first, everyone's favorite clicker. So our channel for clickers is 41. Okay, and let me start the quiz. You may now enter your answer once you know the question. No one's guessing people. Yeah, it's the, and on this on this quiz, there's two points for right answer, one point for wrong answer, zero points you don't come, don't come to class. So a lot of quizzes are structured that way. And ten points for boldness for choosing people. What? I heard channel one. Oh, forty-one. So, yeah. you, you can reset it. One more minute. Okay. And close polling. And the right answer. So these are leaf cutter ants, right? But they are cutting leaves for what? For fungi, right. So these things are really cool evolutionarily because you see them out, you know, they're actually some of the biggest herbivores where they live, but they're actually not eating the plants, they're feeding them to their fungi and um, busy growing fungi in gardens. Okay, and there's really cool symbiosis and there's other players in the system now too. So there's parasitic fungi that will come in and kill the fungi. So the ants have special bacteria on their bodies that are sort of antifungal ones that kill this parasitic fungus. There's a really cool system that's evolved. Okay. And so the reason these are cool is for the example of symbiosis. Okay. Um, next question. What am I holding up? I'll wander around the room. Can you see it again? Oh, nice. Okay. Um, one more minute. Okay. Excellent. So, ammonite, right. So, 81% of you knew that. It's pretty cool. All right. So, that's the end of clickers for right now. So, before we get into phylogenetics, though, someone asked a very good question from last time that I didn't explain well. Um, this sort of ancestral derived thing, right? And so, for <coughs> characters, um, you could say ancestral and derived, okay? Some people might say primitive, please don't, but it's actually okay ish. Um, whereas for taxa, you can't say basically derived for taxa, right? So you're as old as a cockroach, you evolved the same amount of time, right? But some of your traits are ones that 
the ancestor humans and cockroaches possessed, some of their traits are the ones that the ancestors of cockroaches and, and mammals possessed. Right? So we have a mixture of, of ancestral derived traits for all of us. Okay? We don't have basal derived traits. Does that make sense? So, phylogenetics. So, when I was an undergrad like you, actually in my sophomore year, I started working in the lab. Um, this is actually after the introductory biology course that talks about phylogenetics. And this is sort of why I'm doing this, and sort of, sort of trying to show an example of how this is cool. Right? So, <coughs> this is a bark beetle. Um, so, bark beetles, you're seeing those like, lines under the wood, right? the line you know, under bark. That's these guys. Um, and like those ants, many of them actually don't eat wood, they eat fungus that grow in the wood. Okay. And actually the females, when they disperse, have a special sporangium, a little pouch, they fill with spores, and then they fly to a new, um, new tree, they have their little seed stalk, which they start growing in front of Okay? <coughs> and so you can do a lot of the system just looking at the ecology of it, right? Which fungi are they, are they with? Are they in the tree? Parasites, that sort of question, right? When you add in a phylogeny, you can do even more. So, what we did was we made a phylogeny of these beetles by sequencing, I think it was three different genes, which nowadays is sort of pathetic, but back then was cool, um, and inferring this phylogeny. Okay? So, this set of relationships. And then you can map traits on this tree, right? So, red shows when agriculture evolved. Okay. So when these, when these fields started, started farming fungi. So already we know, that, wow, this happened seven different times. Right, it was something we didn't know before. Okay. So evolved seven times. Okay, agriculture is a complex trait. How they evolve at that many times? Is it pre adapted to it? Is it the same fungus? Is it hops around to already knows how to be filming an agricultural crop? Yeah, I start asking those questions. We also know that inbreeding evolves many times, often but not always around when farming happens. Okay? And these bills are cool because in most species we have a 50 50 sex ratio. Right? And the reason why, we'll get to later. Okay? Basically, it's, um, if you have more males than females, there's an advantage to have females, right? Because they have more, they have more offspring on average than the male would. So then it skews back. So you have a stabilizing selection for 50 50. But here you could have 19 females in a brood and one male. It's a weird system. And the reason for that is in a little gallery, there'll be a male who will emerge, and it's a very weird form. His front is this armored thing with jaws, and his back is this squishy little pointless thing. And <coughs> um, what he's, he's adapted to mate with his sisters, and then go over to a neighboring gallery, try to kill that guy, and mate with all those sisters too. So, because you have this inbreeding, you can have this weird sex ratio, right? Because then the females that have the most, fem the most female offspring have the most grandchildren, okay? And you might say, does this, does this correlate with agriculture in some way? And then we can start getting at that question by using the phylogeny, okay? We can also look to see what affects the diversity of beetles, okay? And so, this is actually a subset of species, which is for all the species in different groups, we find that those angiosperms are more diverse than their sister group. Okay. So what's, this, what's the sister group? How about yesterday? Okay. <laughs> so everybody knows that we're two different plays, right? Those two sisters to each other. Okay. Good question. Um, and so in this case, they have the same history until this is split, and then one half becomes ages from feeding, one half is conflict feeding. If you compare that, they start off with one species each, how they diversify, and those that eat angiosperms have more species, and those that eat conifers. Okay? So you have something about eating angiosperms that leads to higher diversity. Okay? So now I ask, start asking questions about speciation or extinction rate in the angiosperm feeders and the conifer feeders. And again, get, get these questions from simple observations of modern stuff and three genes. 
Okay. It was a very, very powerful way of figuring out when things have happened, what has happened, what correlates to time. <coughs> Any questions on that? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so how do you choose what genes? So basically when you're making a tree, you want to have changes happen in every branch, right? If you have no changes, you can't figure out which, which relationship it is, right? It's polytonic. Um, you don't have to change if you're going fast enough to resolve it. If you're going too fast, then um, change can be masked, right? So if every site is changed multiple times, it's not all the information there. So you want to have two genes that have a mixture of rates that you give less information. Um, but also you want genes that you can actually, you know, sequence in the lab. Like this, you know, getting primers, this old, old style PCR, and getting primers is hard to do. Um, nowadays you can use, you know, genomes and then you get the best genes. And of course you don't have to use genes, you can use morphology or things like that. Um, but genes, you know, I was an undergrad, I could get genes. Um, I don't know enough of those, you know, after several years in the lab to go do them. But of course, with fossils, it's harder to do genes. So cool if you can. Um, okay, so just to review again, because of phylogeny, remember it represents population and then splits. And again, it's a series of nestings. Right, so this clay nested in this clay. So. One thing to remember about phylogeny is that they're the, these idealized things in life is always is messier, right? So here's an actual population all the time, right? So its population size can change. Right? We can have things going extinct. We can have population becoming sub subdivided, right? So we have population on the west side of the Smokies and the east side of the Smokies that might not interbreed that much, right? So it's not quite different species, but sort of, right? That, the, the population. You can have, you know, this implies, you know, well, one species, boom, two species, right? Actually, it could be a gradual process. So then it's gradual reduction in gene flow. And it's We can have introgression, right? So they're evolving separately, and then a few wander in here and leave a few genes, right? You can have full hybridization, right? Two species, I mean, third species. All that was sort of abstract away and make this simple trick. We're now working, we have people have some methods to deal with this, okay? And a little bit of stuff to deal with this sort of thing and this sort of thing. It's still very early days for now. Okay? So when I, when I show you these trees, know that it's a simplification of this messy process. And so you start thinking about other biases or problems that could come from this simplification. Okay. Here's a plot showing growth of phylogenetics through time. Okay, so Venn diagrams, so loose phylogen, phylogens, phylogenetics, phylogeny, and then evolution in college, so ecological ecology. As it starts off, the phylogenetics will have a pimple inside of evolution. Right? And these are papers per year. And as we go through time, we see, first of all, phylogeny got even bigger. Overlap in a lot. It's used in both fields. Also, here's the yeah, absolute number of publications, and it's taking off. So, other people like it too, not just me. All right, so how do you make a phylogeny? So, here's one way. Um, it's actually done with someone in. So, we'll use actually just on the hall the post here. Okay. So, you select what you want to work on. Say, so I want to study beetles. I want to study um, a plant group in Puerto Rico. Okay. You select the genes you want. Okay. You'll have the right amount of variation. You can try pulling sequences from GenBank. You can try generating sequences yourself. You can sort of filter them. Because okay. now you might find, okay, this sequence was badly done. Um, the thing is actually just mislabeled. So, you've got to filter them. Estrophology, which is just making sure that the genes sort of align properly. Filter, align again, and then infer a tree. 
Okay. And I don't need, need you to know the details of this. You want to sort of just know the general way you make a tree. Okay. You get data, make sure the data line up properly, and then you do some magic program, which we'll talk about in a while, that then gives you the tree. Okay. <coughs> and here we see a plot of different ways to, grow, to make a tree. Right? So why don't you make a tree based on the simplest, simplest explanation of the data possible. Okay, that's called fraction learning. One is based mm -hmm. on explicit model of evolution, and that's likelihood or Bayes, and also other models, right? And so we see through time how these models are used change, right? So like Asian approaches to thought. And these labels, all different programs are used. Okay, so there are actually hundreds of thousands of programs, um, and so here's a few of the main ones. Okay. And, you know, there are religious wars about this. Are you in the red stripe or are you in the green stripe? Right. Um, there have been huge battles, lots of hatred. You know, being, you know societies have split in half over these issues. Okay. Um, <coughs> you know, are you doing, you know, do you have the right philosophy for doing science and that sort of thing? We're going to gloss over that right now. Um, you know, it's really fun to talk about. But you know, just know that there are different ways of doing this. Okay. The hope is that you know, with enough data, they'll all converge in the same tree. Right? The truth will out. Right? Um, but it might not, in those different biases. Okay, so finding the legends is hard. Okay? So it's computation hard for several reasons. One of them is it's sort of hard in a computer science sense. All right, so here's this problem I gave you, right? And it's just adding stuff up. I mean, we should all be able to add. Right? This should not be a hard problem. What's the answer? Right, so why is it hard for you? What's, 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 the, what's the difficulty? So there's many, many possible solutions, right? And it's easy to verify solutions. So I said, oh, one answer is 12 sampler plates. You would say, no, right? <laughs> it's very easy to reject solutions, right? But it's very hard to find, for example, that um, seven mixed fruit is a solution, right? But it is. Um, <coughs> right? So that's the possible. Then you can verify that solution very easily. Okay. And a lot of five minutes problems are like that. So I have a tree, you know, what tree is better than my, my tree right now? What tree has fewer changes, say? Well, there's a lot of trees to look at. There's actually more trees than there are atoms in the universe with a small, small sample size problem. Right? So what you can do is then propose a new tree, compare it, but actually know that it's the best one it's really hard to do. So that's why doing the searches can take days, months, even. The famous data set a few years ago, well, several years, two decades ago actually, called Zilla, that was 500 taxa long. It was a huge data set. And it took a month to do, and then they published a the paper, and someone had a new algorithm, and in a few weeks they found a better tree. Um, but now people are doing trees of tens of thousands of species. Okay. So here, here's a tree. So we've talked about this tree a little bit. This is a tree of mammals. And this is a super tree. This is a tree made not from original genetic data or morphological data, but a tree made from combining other trees. And you see it applies some weird things, for example, with primates, right? So this whole play with primates. And where those primates originated, you know, 100 million years ago. Right? So monkeys are running from T Rex. This is a controversial. And there have been later pu publications that have changed the dates. Okay, so I was going to be skeptical about trees. Well, you can see how it allows us to make hypotheses, right? So this tree predicts that we should be able to find monkey fossils in the Cretaceous. Do we? That's it. We don't test that. <laughs> um, now, we can make trees for stuff that's not organisms. So here's a tree for languages. Portuguese, Brazilian, Spanish, Catalan. 
to figure out this tree of human languages. Okay. And there are various ways to do this. Um, you can look for sort of common words or common sounds. I actually had a student work a semester on compressibility. So the idea is that languages that are similar, if you sort of like zip, like, like on your computer, compress them, the more similar they are, the smaller the file. And so she scanned in the Bible, the orphan species, Harry Potter, in different, in different Slavic languages, and then found that the tree you get from that actually matches what you think is actually the true tree of Slavic languages. Which is crazy. So there are various ways to get these traits. <coughs> okay, so here's an issue we've dealt with, the sort of the tree of all life, and again, this is a chronogram, so the day is important. And here you see many, 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 many. Okay, um, one thing you should be asking yourself is, where do I get these trees, right? So you can make your own. Um, but there are also, you know, trees like this that are hard to make. Can you get them from somewhere and use it for your data? And in some cases, yes. Um, there are like websites that have repositories of trees. In this case, no. They hold on to the tree and won't, won't share it with anyone. So you can buy a poster of the tree. You can actually buy, use it to get the tree and use it before and for analysis. So that's sort of back to the business of how science works. You know, this is sort of interesting way of share data or don't share data. So here's another tree. Um, so this is 15,000 species. It's a huge tree, and this took you know a lot of grammar to be drawn. So like you can just learn the data set. It doesn't work on most computers. Um, and here's another reason finding trees is hard. Right. So here's the number of taxa, and here is the number of trees that live like, and here is exponential growth. Log scale, right? So, is the number of trees does the number of trees grow exponentially? Almost. If it were exponentially, it would be linear on a log scale. Right? It's actually going faster than that. Right? So think, think something's awful is growing exponentially. Right? Climate change. The problem is growing exponentially. You know, whatever. Um, this is actually worse than that. Right? This grows factorially actually. So, um, you know, and as we see, if we get to, you know, the number of atoms in the universe is here, right? And this is like 50 taxa, 50 taxa, right? So, <coughs> we just want to record all the possible trees for 50 taxa, and to you know, make one mark on each atom, right? And then I'm out. If you want to record it for 60 taxa, there's nowhere to store it, right? And then you put it on all black right? Um, <coughs> And you saw a tree of 13,000 species. Right, so this huge universe, you can never find all, you have to actually look up all the trees in there. Okay? And so, for example, for that 13,000 taxon tree, if I want to expand it by just two taxa, right, how much does my search space expand? Well, it's as if I was trying to find a rubber ducky somewhere on campus, right? And then by adding two taxa, Search space grows so much that it's finding it on the entire planet. Okay, this is factorial growth. This is scary. Okay, so this is also why finding trees can be hard. Okay. Another thing that's hard with phylogenetics is actually just looking at the darn things. Okay, so here's a tree that has thirteen thousand names. Okay, your Spiffy HD TV has nineteen twenty pixels. Right, so how many names can you put in a pixel that you can read? Well, far fewer than one, right? Um, so you can't even like, list all the names on display. A fancy computer monitor, you know, tile opening those, this resolution, right? So again, you can't see all the names. What some people actually do is this. Print paste. This is the state of art for visualization. Okay. There actually are other ways that allow like dynamic scaling and things like that. You actually want to be able to see everything at once. You start with paper. Okay. So even just looking at the things can be. Okay. <clears throat> so why bother with them? So they're hard to get. They take a lot of time, take a lot of memory, a lot of speed. So what are they good for? So here's a simple example. Let's go back to our fly example. Right? So when you have fl five fly species, and they differ in body color and eye color. Okay. 
and I want to know I have a hypothesis. So the orange ones feed on oranges. Is it camouflage? Let's see. So did they become orange? Did they better feed on oranges, or were they already that color? There's some pre-adaptation, right? So how can we test this? Okay, let's imagine, let's leave phylogenesis aside. If you don't have phylogenesis, how would you test this? Mm -hmm. Right, so I mean, one possibility is that they're orange because they eat orange things and the orange die somehow. And so this way you could see if it's sort of an endogenous trait that they can produce themselves. Good. And there's this variation to create it too. Good. That gives us part of the way there. Mm -hmm. That's true, yes. Yeah. So it's not clear here that the purple ones don't feed an orange. They're already feeding an orange ahead of time. Good. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're camouflaged by our vision, right? But we see a particular spectrum, right? Is something that sees in UV seen as camouflaged? There's a mantis shrimp that has all you can see, you know, all these mantis shrimp. I don't know if these are flies, but they, they're cool. But they have you know many more kinds of color colors receptors than we do, so they can see many more colors than we can. Do they see them as camouflage? Are they were the predators? I don't know. Um, but you get the idea, right? So it's good. All right. So what we first do is test. This, what we first, can first do is test to see are they actually adapting? Right? Is this you know something they're creating themselves or taking the art, taking the art orange? So it's not really evolution, um, and is it you know, actually adaptive? Then how about the origin origin question? Let's assume that we find out that they are camouflaged. How do you find out which happened first, eating oranges or camouflage? Is it post or pre adaptation? It's really hard, right? But not with the phylogeny. No. All right. So let's imagine how do how do you actually figure out when they become orange? Well, one thing you could do is something called parsimony. Okay. So this is just minimizing the number of changes in the tree. So, for example, one possible reconstruction is this. So I could say that this ancestor is purple. This ancestor is orange. This is orange. And this is orange. Okay, that's one possible way to reconstruct the tree. How many changes does this, does this require in color? Mm -hmm. Two. Perfect. Yep. So two changes, both orange to purple. Okay. Is there a better reconstruction than this? Yes. Okay, what is it? Make this one purple? Good. One change. It's more parsimonious. Okay. Why do you want? Why do you want parsimony? Why do you want? Why, why do you want simplicity? Mm -hmm. Right. Because we think change is difficult. Right. So involving this orange pigment or something, it probably is more likely to happen once than twice. The win the lottery once or win the lottery twice. Well, all of the things be equal, probably win it once. Good. One thing you have an argument against this. Why wouldn't you want to use parsimony sometimes? Mm-hmm. 
Right. So if this branch were really, really, really long, right, it's possible that somewhere on there it changed from purple to orange and back. Right? The parsimony of oh, that. Good. What else? Okay, what do you mean? Right, so convergent evolution can happen with parsimony. We try to dismiss that, right? So even though you know, even though it happens ten percent of the time, under parsimony happens zero percent of the time. Good. What else? What sort of traits wouldn't evolve parsimoniously? Flying? Why? He's evolved, we think, in four taxa. Yeah. But how about lack of flying? Right. So lack of flying has evolved a lot, too. Right? Or other complex traits like eyes. You think of a K-fish, they're losing their eyes, and that sort of thing. Um, so you have these cases where you think it's easier to lose a trait than to gain a trait. Right? And so therefore, you just want to try to minimize the overall number of changes. You might say, OK, yep. Yeah. So I could have one loss of eyes and one gain of eyes. Or I could have one gain of eyes so it's like I have, I could have, um, you know, two gains of eyes and two losses of eyes, or I could have one gain of eyes and three losses of eyes, which is more likely. More losses, right? But if I just do simple flat parsimony, I would not have that. I would have equal weights for each, each change. Okay. There's ways to get around that with parsimonies. You can penalize certain changes more than others, um, but also you can just use methods that deal with how to model evolution. Right. And so now most people doing this sort of question use a model of evolution. The problem is easier to understand. So this is mm -hmm. where some of the, so the, those, those religious fights about like, methods. Okay. okay. So we have this history now that we think is right. Okay. And back to our question. Do you want to feed an oranges? Do they become orange to feed better camouflage or are they already that color? Okay. So how can we test it with this now? Are we done? Not quite, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so could, yeah, so could be we're, we're mistaken about this association. Good. Um, let's assume for this that we that we have it right. That the purple don't eat orange, don't orange do. But it's good to think about our original data can be wrong because actually that happens a lot. And um, actually, we're, have, we're revising a paper now for Nature, where someone said, "Okay, well, this is great, but what if these data points are wrong?" Like, oh, okay. So we're doing some simulations to say, "Okay, if the data points are wrong by this amount, we still get the right answer, or what we think is the right answer." And so that's an important thing. That's something that kept us out of nature, just fixing that problem. So I'll see if they can do that again. Okay. Okay, so let's assume the data are right and we know orange equals equals orange feeding. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, so easy oranges, easy fingers. Yeah. Good. So how do you how would you test that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can figure out when oranges evolve. So we could do a phylogeny of oranges. We also use fossil data. Yep. And I could find, for example, so first of all, I want to make a tree that's calibrate the time to know if I find oranges evolve oranges evolve five million years ago, where is that on this tree? Because if I hold these nodes are on the tree, and then I could put on say. The orange is evolved here. Not the bottom, I'm not sure if this is true. It's just hypothetical. Um, let's say they evolved here. Okay? So, what do we think about our hypothesis now?
Is it consistent with, consistent with the hypothesis or not consistent? Consistent, right? So we have orange color evolving after orange fruit. We're consistent with the hypothesis. Does it prove it's right? No. It doesn't prove it's wrong. Right? Whereas if this were the tree, right, and orange evolve here, right? So now know what's happened. I have the same number of taxa of each state. But all of them have a different tree. Now the reconstruction is different. Okay, again, only one change. But I'm saying the essential form is orange. Okay? So it suggests that they were orange before oranges were around. Okay? Which rejects the hypothesis. Right? So you can see, you know, questions about these. So, you know, it's amazing power of phylogenetics is once you have a tree and you have these observations, you can make inferences about causes happening, you know, 15 million years ago. So if you can't even see now, right? It's using this information. Okay, what else is it useful? So here are the plots. What does, what does this plot suggest about leaf lifespan and leaf size? Okay. Right. Does that make sense? Why? You have this big leaf, this big expensive leaf. I throw it away quickly. This tiny leaf, I hold on to it forever. It's kind of weird, right? Okay. Well, each of these dots is a different species. Okay. So what are the assumptions of most statistical methods? Sort of IID. Sort of. It's saying that um, all things are independent and identically distributed. Right? So when it's compare <coughs> um, you know uh, family income and shirt color or something. Right? And if a bunch of you are all siblings and all bought shirts at the same you know, bulk pack, right? That's gonna screw the, skew the results, right? Because they're not you're not independent points. You have this whole group of points that are all at the same point, just overcounted. Right? Are species independent? No. Why? Right. So there's the in, right. So there's non-independence due to interactions. Good. What's well, no way that they're not independent? They share history, right? So um, a red oak and a white oak are similar not because they've independently arrived at this oak phenotype, because they share this whole history together, right? So if um, this is an oak, and this is an oak. Are they two, da two independent data points? No. Right? So anything to do with the regression stuff is using the wrong technique, just doing bad stats. Right? How can we correct for that? Moral today? Phylogeny! <laughs> right? <coughs> so we take a phylogeny and use an approach called independent contrast, and all this is basically the same. Right, I'm thinking of all these different points, which is compare basically these two groups. So I'm saying, you know, where did lead say, in this one, that lead longer, relative to this one, relative to the leads are bigger or smaller than the other one. Okay? And we get all these comparisons, and now we find this. Is there a correlation here? Nope. Doesn't seem to be. Right? Except for is this one comparison, one thing here. Okay. And what is that? Well, if you look at this tree, right, I have here I have a change. Okay. So here I have things that are angiosperms, angiosperms, um, and there are things that aren't gymnosperms. Okay. And so these all have small long lived leaves. And these have big short-lived leaves. Okay, so this comparison right here is comparing this one to this one. Okay, but if I don't correct the phylogeny, basically all these points, you see them. They have hours to do it. Um, <coughs> you see they have like this clump here, and right here, and this clump here, and right here. So all this pattern just comes from this one change. 
they have overcounted that second pair. This with this, this with this, this with this. That would have to be just one change in the tree. Okay. But by using the tree and using a simple method that basically takes away one data point's worth of power, you can then correct for this. And when you write a paper, people won't yell at you. Okay? And also, you not, might not get the wrong answer, right? which is always a nice thing in science. <coughs> okay, what else can you do with this stuff? Well, sometimes you think, so remember how I, talk, I was talking about over here yesterday about um, mutation rates and substitution rates, and how, sort of, how the amount of change is proportional to the amount, amount of mutations, right? We can use it to actually get dates for things. Right? So you know when these islands diverge, you know how different the species are, and you can't make inferences about how fast they evolve. Okay? And you can start actually being other things in this. Seriously, so you see, here I know when you've got an island diverge, and found out that you know, on these trees, all the colors are not time. You don't have change. Here's a very cool example. <laughs> Where birds, flies in general have small genome sizes, right? Is it because carrying all that DNA is heavy and you can't fly as well? Well, probably not. It has to do with more with metabolic rate. Okay? And so the question is that birds are dinosaurs, birds are flying dinosaurs, which evolved first, fat, you know, small genome size or flight? And so here they actually need the bird genome size um, and then you construct it on the tree to figure out when birds evolve, when small genome Okay, so Velociraptors probably had a small genome size too. Okay. We've got rates of evolution. Okay. So for example, here, here are woody plants, here are herbaceous plants. Which one evolves faster? So you have brain plants that are proportional to time, they're proportional to amount of change. So if you're going to take this, so here we have two sister groups, right? And the root to tip length here is much shorter than here, right? This had a whole lot more changes happening. Okay. What might that be? Mm -hmm. Yep, short generation times. All right, so if you start introducing mutations when you have uh, recombination during sex and that's leading up to sex and that sort of thing, that could lead to faster substitution rates. We look at how genomes evolve, right? And so here we have instances of what is the genome transfer. So we have different bacterial species, and bacterial species um, And we can look at you know when we have genes going from one group to another group. Okay, and we find out that whoa, you know, in a lot of these um, uh, archaea and eubacteria, they're swapping genes back and forth, okay? which makes inferring phylogeny a pain. But it's an interesting thing about how they evolve. It also affects us today. You know, so if I have endobacterial resistance of one bacterium, I can really look it up. Yes. Okay. Here you can look at genome du genome duplications. Right? So here's actually the time the entire genome duplicate. Okay. That's cool because when you duplicate genomes, now you have a whole bunch of redundant genes. Okay. If you use redundant genes to do something similar but slightly different. And you look at the evolutionary potential. Okay, so <coughs> um, here they look at correlations between limb lengths for different groups of primates. Right. So if you think about a quad quadruped. Right. If I have an organism and a bunch of balls, you know, much bigger forelimbs and hind limbs, it's such a walking quadruped. Right. Imagine deer like that. Right. Being a little forest. <coughs> and so it's evolutionary advantageous to have these limb lengths correlated. Right? But then if you start using limbs for different things, if you can break that correlation, then you can evolve separately for each optimum. So, for example, gibbons okay, start evolving um, low correlation, right? So they can have their tiny little pointless legs, and then really their arms are swimming through the trees. Right? They can evolve that faster than if they had evolved both at the same time. We also look at things like biogeography, right? So where these plant species evolve, 
hybrid squares across continents. Okay? Or even finer scale, looking at range evolution. Where they happened, where they occurred in the past. We look at traits, uh, uh, ecological traits. Right, so here I see mean local temperature range, and here I see precipitation. So it looks like this clay has evolved a different temperature range than these, right? whereas these are sort of all overlapping here. Okay? So it might be sort of displacement, ecological displacement for temperature rather than precipitation. It might be harder to see if all I show you was just the tips and then labeled by degree. Like, there's just some trees. Oh, of course, look. Here's another case of looking at evolutionary processes. So, basses are really great at eating minnows. Well adapted to catching that sort of thing. Some fish, some eat small crustaceans, some eat snails, some eat plants. So the question was, do sunfish jaws evolve faster? Are they evolving to fit eat these different things? And so they actually tested and found, yep, they evolve faster than other groups. That's so actually now test that, and then directly test that question. Okay. Then the kids are looking at rates. So the world's biggest flower, possibly an inflorescence, but they're still arguing. Like this really smelly thing called the Felesia. Okay. His close relatives are these tiny, tiny things. How did it get so big? You can figure out that right here is a really fast rate of evolution. Okay. So they're also like, yeep, mm -hmm. yep, and now big, then big. Yeah. So they're asking what happened here. Okay. Human society. So again, anything that evolves, you know, its inheritance could be on a tree. So it could be language, it could be human societies. Right? So here we have Polynesia, right? And we have to have people, you know, land here, from a society, and then some people disperse from a new society, and so forth. Right? And the question was, when, they, when societies change, how do, they, how do they change? What order do they change? Do they go from having, you know, just people living in single family groups, moving to a big state system? Or do you go sort of step by step? Do you have to go in one direction only? How can you test this? Well, you can fit this, these data on a tree, and then use a model and find this, right? So that you see that the size can go, if you go one step only in complexity, with some rare jumps up, but often you can pop all the way back. Right, so you have a city of you know, a state system that sends all tongues to a small island. Mm. Right, so that's here in terms of societal complexity, right? And we figure out just using how societies are now in this tree relating. You can also look at things like where did poisons evolve, where did toxins evolve. They evolved several times in each of the groups. And finally, we can also look at diversification rates. So there are a lot of birds, right? Are all birds evolving quickly in terms of speciation extinction rates, or just some birds? So here's the test and find that, oh, actually it's this group, new avians, is evolving fast, and most of the other group, bird, bird groups aren't evolving that fast. And so you can start doing analysis like that. And so I have time for questions, but we don't have much. So are there any questions on this? Okay. Good. I'll see you on Monday.